Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are so excited to be hosting this event with all of you. Uh, we'll, we'll get things started and, and kick things off right now. We have two incredibly proficient speakers that bring a wealth of knowledge in their respective fields. My name is Neil Johnny, and I will be your moderator for today. I am the sales director at Eclairs, which is an SAP Platinum partner for SAP Business One across Canada and the US. Um, perhaps I'll just ask to mute lines. It looks like it's Vanessa. There you go. Okay, awesome. All right. With the uh, current economic challenges that we all face, rising interest rates, inflation, and talks of a recession looming, it is so important to find uh, ways in which your business can improve efficiencies, increase the productivity of your staff, cut costs, and simply do more with less. Leveraging technology to automate your processes- You need help? And centralizing your business data onto one platform is a key strategy to achieving those objectives. Understanding how to go about selecting an ERP is equally as important um, and how you should implement that solution as well is super critical, but not fully understood at the onset. Today's webinar focuses on explaining what is an ERP solution and when does a business truly need to begin to invest in a robust enterprise-wide solution? We will talk you through what an ideal ERP selection project, project should include and discuss what an optimal implementation process looks like to ensure overall success and user adoption. And then we'll wrap up with a Q&A session at the very end. Our speakers for today are Rachel Radford and Erin A. Jacobs. Rachel Radford is the owner of Mara Consulting. She has supported small to medium-sized organizations and municipal governments in technology strategy and technology adoption for over 10 years. The Merit team helps companies select technologies that are the right fit long-term uh, through a solution agnostic approach, helping with anything from ERPs to e-commerce, CRM, and BI tools. Erin A. Jacobs is the Vice President at Eclaros Incorporated. She has over 10 years of experience that spans across consulting to project management in the SAP Business One space. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to our first speaker, Rachel. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to be getting right into ERP, which is a really big topic matter. So we're going to go pretty quickly through this um, with lots of information on the slides, but we're just going to hit the key points because as we all know, an ERP can be a bit of a beast. Um, so when we're talking about an ERP, I thought it would be helpful for us to just start with what it is, an enterprise resource planning system. ERPs certainly have that core financial asset within them, so really managing the financial resources within your business, but they also encompass the other resources that need to be planned for and used throughout the project cycle or the sales cycle or the manufacturing cycle. So including not just financial, but also physical items such as your inventory and the human resources and capital that need to go into the business execution. An ERP is really meant to be that central hub for core data for your systems and processes across the entire business. Your financial, your inventory, your human resources, all of those elements, all of those data elements need to live in this system ideally for all of that robust data and reporting to really help you make good business decisions. When we're thinking about an ERP system, a lot of organizations, you know, first think about that financial management component, but we want it to do a lot more than that. And that's really where an ERP comes into place. One thing to think about is what an ERP is not. You know, an ERP can do many things and touch many of the business processes across your organization. But in essence, it's still not going to do that marketing management component. It's not going to handle every aspect of quality control or every aspect of health and safety. 
this slide might help kind of illustrate where those lines start to get a bit gray across the different types of solutions that are out there in the market. So when we think about what an ERP can do, fundamentally, every ERP should be able to handle those financial management aspects of your business, so those blue ones, as well as items like the order management, purchasing or procurement, your inventory management, and if your business is in the manufacturing or distribution goods kind of related space, it should also be handling all of those components out of the box. Traditional ERPs really fit within that blue sector across the board. When we start comparing different ERP solutions to each other though, you start to see where some applications and systems have a more robust out of the box platform and are handling the yellows. So looking at shop floor control and warehouse management, supply chain management aspects, as well as some of that project management piece. They may not handle them in the original out of the box solution, but there's additional applications that you can bring in. Some of them do have it out of the box. So when we're looking at different ERP systems, we do want to think about what are all the things we want this system to do in terms of data and process management and which ERPs include the blues and the yellows. And do we need to also look for one that also includes some of those gray ones. So when we're looking at gray. It's a little bit different for each ERP system, but several ERP systems out in the market now do offer some of these additional applications, either in-house in the structure and data structures of the current ERP, or with an external add-on application that was built to work with that ERP system. So those gray ones that we're looking at, you know, getting into business intelligence tools and data and reporting and getting in customer relationship management, that CRM, quoting, point of sale, a lot of those additional applications, we need to work seamlessly with our ERP and financial data. There are ERPs out there that do offer these additional applications. So again, when you're looking for an ERP, we want to get really clear on what we want it to do and how many other aspects of the business we want it to run before we make a decision. One of the things that we do get asked a lot is at what point does an ERP make sense? It is a huge technology investment compared to other types of tech platforms that are out there. So you wanna take it quite seriously as an investment of your time, your capacity, funds as well, but the time it takes to really do an ERP implementation right, we wanna make sure that we're making the decision at the right time. So when does that time make sense for, for us to start putting that in our technology strategy? If your business is touching manufacturing and distribution, so it's really looking at the physical movement of goods across the sales through to supply chain, getting it into your customers' hands, a lot of manufacturing and distribution businesses would really benefit from an ERP solution, um, even more so than a services-based businesses in a lot of ways because it manages so many more of your business processes. If you start having more than say 25 staff that are involved in that order processing process, you have multiple locations, there's many suppliers that you're bringing in goods from when you have many hundreds of customers and they're really actively doing repeat business with you and you have a lot of SKUs, when you start hitting a couple of these different things, an ERP solution might really make sense for your business because again, it's going to manage and and streamline the processes across all of those different touch points, both on the data, the business process side, and just make sure that everybody's doing things in a very systematic way so that we can capture all of that good information and use it for better business decisions. Some of the other pieces that come into play is if you're really struggling with inventory, supply chain, figuring out accurate costing on projects, uh, forecasting and having issues with forecasting around procurement and production. Again, these are good trigger points to start thinking about an ERP. So once you get to the point where you think an ERP, I think does make sense. It's in our technology strategy. It's in our roadmap. We need to start going down this road. We need to start thinking about how do you approach an ERP project so that it is going to be a successful investment. It really falls into three categories, discovery, implementation, and adoption. Irene is gonna walk us through some of those best practices and pitfalls to avoid on the implementation side and adoption side. I'm gonna focus on the discovery side of things. So when we think about discovery, it kind of falls into two major categories within this phase, understanding your requirements and documenting them, 
and then going out to market and selecting ERPs. What we find a lot of folks kind of trip up with is getting that understanding of the requirements across your organization and getting everyone to agree in your organization of what we're expecting this ERP solution to do is something that we often see clients rush through. It comes with a lot of challenges when you rush it. One of the big things is we want to make sure that everybody in-house agrees on the expectations of this system because there's no way at the end of the project to say it was a success or not if we're not agreeing on what success looks like. So that's a good starting point for anybody going down that ERP journey. The second piece is we don't want to just take our current state processes and slap them into a new system. There's no benefit to doing that. So we do really want to make sure that we're capturing what is the current state the challenges with it, the opportunities that we see within it, and translating that into what do our future state business processes need to look like in a new system so that we actually can make the most out of improvements in the business process side of things, the training and coaching of our staff, and then also get the system to marry up with that. Something that we find quite helpful when you're going through preparing for releasing a request for proposal, preparing for demonstrations of different software solutions, is to have the staff that are going to be kind of critical stakeholders of the major processes that are going to live in the ERP come up with demo scenarios that they want to see. So really coming up with um, a couple of storylines of actual things that you want the, the ERP system to monitor and manage, getting it into a bit of a storyline with some data preferably to back it up so that when you go to the different vendors kind of after that RFP gets released, you can say, hey, can each of you show us these six to eight scenarios? It's easier to compare apples to apples when you do that. And it helps the internal stakeholders visualize what this would look like in the new system. So it's a, it's a really helpful part. The other thing to think about is when we say requirements, it's one thing to come up with your business requirements around this is how I want it to function, but you also need to think through the technical requirements of this. Do you need your data hosted in a certain country because of rules around your organization has around data access? Do we need to have you know, integrations with our existing technologies in place? What would those take? What does that look like to maintain? We need to think about all of those kind of technical requirement aspects of this when making our selection choices. And we also really want to think through data and reporting, where an ERP can be incredibly powerful and a game changer for your business is if you have the data within that system that actually informs good business decisions. So we need to get super clear on what those re reporting requirements are to make sure we make the right choice. When we're selecting the ERP, so when we're actually taking our requirements, going out and figuring out which two or three ERP solutions might fit the bill, how do we compare them to make that actual decision? And that's the piece we're going to get into next. So what to consider in selection? These are a couple of the elements that we would always suggest you consider in the decision matrix when you're comparing a couple of different solutions. We often will just look at cost and maybe timelines, but we want to think about the other aspects that will impact long term costs, holding costs and maintenance costs of these systems um, and and just what it's going to do for us over time, because it's one thing to go live with it. It's another to go live and to maintain what it's able to do and take advantage of new elements of the system that are built in and are released as that system progresses in its life cycle. So when we're thinking about five year costing, we want to think about not just the implementation, the initial licensing and the configuration costs. We need to think about hosting. Is there any ongoing configuration? Are there any add-ons? Are there any integrations? Are there APIs we need to maintain? All the different elements of costing that come into play, not just to get it live, but to maintain it throughout its life cycle, 5, 10, 15 years with our business. The next piece is around longevity. And we think of this in terms of you know, what is the scalability of that system? What tier of system are we looking at for the size of our business and the complexity of our business? What pre-built APIs are going to be maintained versus are custom built, more expensive to maintain? Um, thinking about what the development roadmap is in the system itself, because they're going to come up with new releases or new features within each new release every year or 18 months, two years. So how are we going to assess some of those and how that needs to factor into our decision? Some other elements we need to think about. 
The ERP tier we touched on, so kind of the complexity of the system. ERP specialization. So if you're in a specific industry, you might want to look for ERPs that were specifically built for your industry. You'll still want to compare them to some of the best in breed to see if what is happening that's specific to your industry means that you're sacrificing some of the other best in breed functionality that's out there. But you also want to think about implementation partner. The way that ERPs work is they go from the system itself, that's the actual platform, the implementation partner is the group that actually is your partner forevermore for a very long relationship cycle. They're the one that does all the implementation, they're the ones that manage your licensing agreements, they're the ones you go to when things don't work. Um, so that is actually a huge part of what you want to consider when you're making your, your ERP selection. And it's something that often companies, if they're not familiar with an ERP, kind of miss this as being a key component of the ERP selection. A couple of things we'll highlight really, really quickly on what gets missed in discovery and can really pose a challenge later on down the road. So these are some of the risks you want to avoid and some things that you want to really think through and make sure that you're touching on before you select an ERP solution. That first being around strategic alignment. So making sure that the people that are actually making the decision in your company about which ERP you're going to choose, are they all aligned? on the expectations of what this is going to do for us or in just not going to do for us so that we don't have confusion later on down the road about the scope of this project, the needs and requirements that we have within here, any of those other factors. We want to make sure that we are all on the same page internally about what our expectations are so that this is actually going to be a smooth project process and we're not going to have a boatload of change orders that kind of muck up the timelines and budget on the project because we weren't all in sync. It's a huge factor is really making clear that success. What is it for our company? The other piece is, is thinking through what priority is this ERP program across our entire organization. You might have 15 different things you're trying to do in the next three years, and they're all really important. They're all really strategic. Where does the ERP system implementation sit in that sequence? Because not everything can be on that top spot. It's a huge investment. It takes a lot of your internal effort to really make sure that it's going to be successful. Are we committed to that? If not, maybe now isn't the time. Um, a couple of things around documentation. There's a lot of elements of conversations that are going to happen during discovery and during implementation of an ERP project. You do want to ensure that there is somebody in the organization or in the project team that is documenting everything that is decided upon, everything that is uh, like a requirement of what's going to get built, decisions that are made around how this needs to get built and why we made that decision, because they are going to come up when user acceptance testing happens, when training happens, after go live, two years after go live, you need to have that documentation so people aren't second guessing the choice and the investment. We're all clear and we can all go back to those same pieces. So really having things accurately documented throughout this entire process is a powerful element that happens um, or comes up across many years down the road. So it's something you want to pay attention to. The other two elements that come into play are really around selection criteria. So we talked a little bit about that with the pie chart. What are all of the different aspects that we need to think about when we're comparing different ERP solutions? Making sure that the right people are involved in even picking the selection criteria is an important aspect. So making sure that, you know, finance is at the table and IT is at the table, and most importantly, that the business that actually is going to use this tool is at the table when we're having these conversations about what matters when we pick between A and B, um, just to make sure that we're all super clear on the weight that we need to apply, what's important to the business, what needs to get factored in, and have we missed something that's really critical that actually would change our decision in an impactful way? Have we thought about all of those different elements and are we kind of capturing them within that selection criteria? The other piece is around negotiation of the contract. So we've gone through this entire process, we figured out our requirements, we picked a short list of ERPs, went through demos, saw their proposals and contracts, and we've picked one. When we're reviewing the contract, there's a couple of pieces that aren't legal in nature, but that we do wanna make sure get baked into that contract. 
recognizing we're entering into a very long-term relationship with another company. And we want to make sure that these factors are, are there so that we know when things, you know, there's hiccups, we know how they're going to get dealt with. So a couple pieces we want to look at is not just negotiating on the price point. It's really about looking at how are we going to structure this long-term relationship to be beneficial, to have great communication lines? How are we going to structure it so that all of those pieces are in place? We want to start at looking at like who is the team at the vendor implementation partner that's going to be our team. So like making sure that we're super clear on who that implementation partner is, how any change orders are going to be managed because they are going to come up. We're going to realize we missed something or there's a cool new feature that we need because our business changed. How do we factor in those types of changes that need to get addressed? And then how are we looking at, you know, how are we going to address challenges that come up in the problem? Because they on the project, because they are going to happen. We're going to hit a bump in the road at some point in time. How do we make sure that we're communicating clearly and working together to find a solution? And now I can hand it over to Irene, who's going to walk us through implementation and adoption. All right. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. As Neil mentioned, my name is Erin A. Jacobs. I'm the vice president at Acleros. We've been implementing SAP Business One as a platinum partner to SAP for almost two decades now for hundreds of customers. And we'll be drawing on our experience to share with you some best practices that we've learned along the way. Now that we understand a little bit more about picking the right ERP, understanding the phases of an ERP implementation and the roles and responsibilities is critical to the adoption and success. Going into an ERP implementation with your eyes wide open and realistic expectations of yourself and your implementation partner will ensure that everyone can be prepared for the job ahead. The implementation process of an ERP goes through your five distinct phases that you can see on this slide and the results in a state of continuous improvement. We'll be discussing each of the five phases, uh, project preparation, business blueprinting, realization, final preparation, and go live. Uh, now let's review each of these in more detail to understand what the key success factors are to focus on in each phase. Firstly is the project preparation phase. This is where we set expectations, responsibilities, and establish the technical infrastructure to build a foundation for successful implementation and ERP. This phase is about 10% of the project timeframe. Uh, the main achievements uh, that we wanna accomplish here is really setting an initial plan um, that outlines the scope of the project the timeline and the expected effort. You also identify your project team, which includes your subject matter experts from your organization, the consultants from your implementation partner and the project managers. This team may also include some additional third party members depending on the scope of the project. The technical environment is always also provisioned, whether you're deploying in the cloud or on premise, it comes early on into the project. Lastly, a kickoff meeting is had with all the stakeholders and team members that are identifying to really formalize the start of the project and ensure that everyone has a common understanding of the end goal. To ensure you have a successful preparation phase, make sure that you clearly define the roles of your team members. A false start with missing members or incorrectly placed members can be discouraging and cause some confusion if there's a lot of in and out of members. It is important when you're selecting your subject matter experts that these are people who can make decisions about which way the ERP will be configured and set up that it aligns with the business strategy for the new system. Similarly, when you're identifying your subject matter experts at that point, also indicate within that group who will be your super users and plan their involvement to take a wider interest in their specific silo so they can get a start getting an understanding of the integrated nature of an ERP. Once your project kicks off, your team will also still have day-to-day -day tasks that need to happen in parallel to the ERP. An internal project manager really helps because they have insights into competing demands and will help your team to prioritize to make sure deadlines are still met on the project side as well as on the business end. And lastly, once the technical environment is put into place, it's important to have a handover meeting um, with those who are responsible for what the new technical environment is gonna look like between your internal IT, the ERP implementation provider, the software vendor, or a hosting partner. Next, we move on to the, uh, the business blueprinting phase. This is really focused on understanding your business processes and how the ERP will be used in context to support and enhance those processes. 
And given the importance, as Rachel mentioned, about documenting, the business blueprint takes up a large um, amount of effort. It's usually the largest part of the project. Okay, It usually takes the form of workshop with the business subject matter experts and the functional consultants to marry the ERP processes with the business processes. The design process flows that are a result of these workshops become the basis for training and testing scripts. Critical setup information and config configuration is also included in the blueprint documentation as supporting information when discussing the processes. For example, if the business has a requirement for multi-currency financial reporting, which currencies are required should be identified at this point. The final result um, is a complete business blueprint document that outlines business processes, how the ERP will be configured to achieve those processes, and what training will be required for the users um, once the ERP is designed to the scope. Key things to consider to get the best business proven possible is that the subject matter experts have in-depth knowledge of their business area, the processes, and understand why they need to happen the way that they do. This is not a job for somebody new in the organization. They won't have the experience to really add that value. All ERPs have training materials for users on what is the available functionality. We usually encourage the subject matter experts to go through the training ahead of any workshops that are done. This gives them a head start with respect to functional awareness, as well as terminology, making the workshop sessions more collaborative and productive. During the blueprint phase, the business will be often provided with one, more than one way to solve a problem along with some pros and cons. Your team will be responsible for making informed decisions in a timely manner and really committing to those to consider to ensure the continuity of the project. Indecisions leads to delays and reworks in the project, which ultimately costs time and money. The final blueprint document that you get should not be a technical document, but it should also not be a ERP manual on what the ERP can do, but rather it should be a document that outlines how the ERP will be used to meet your company's needs. Before any sign off of a blueprint document, it is important that the subject matter experts review, provide their feedback and approve what will be going into the ERP as they will be the ones who take ownership of the functionality once it's in the system. This becomes the baseline for the remainder of the project. Now that once the blueprint is signed off and approved, it's really time to start the design and getting all these decisions brought to life. This phase starts with the configuration of the ERP as it was defined in the blueprint. And um, once a blueprint is approved, we have a really good set of rules there. It makes the configuration quite simple. Your key master data, like your products, customers, and vendors are also brought into the system. And if there's any development or customization that is required, it's all completed before testing starts. Once we have all of the work complete, a test environment is provided so that training for the subject matter experts and super users is completed by the functional implementation consultants. Again, we focus pr predominantly on the processes defined at the blueprint during the training. The subject matter experts will establish test scripts for each process to really stress test the configuration, as well as validate the master data according to what the business needs. In the event that something does not work as anticipated or a new requirement is identified, as Rachel mentioned, change orders to happen. Um, this usually comes as a result of testing. A change request is completed and approved before any changes are applied. Once all processes and changes have been tested and super users sign off on what we call a user acceptance testing or UAT, this indicates to the implementation partners and to the rest of the team that the system is configured as required for the business to truly be successful. There are many moving parts in this phase. Um, so consider the following to make sure that it's successful. When working on your master data, start identifying what is needed very early on in the project. Identifying what data is important can be very difficult. So we suggest using data-driven techniques to narrow it down. For example, you may only wanna bring in products um, that you have sold in the last you know, three to four years, whatever makes sense to your business. Leave behind any data that is not required for the new ERP system and set up a strategy on how you're gonna get that data out of your legacy systems and who's gonna be able to help you with that. 
The processes in the, in the blueprint are great starting points to identify what needs to be tested, but it is important that your super users track real life use cases that are common scenarios and test them thoroughly throughout the process as well. It's great to take a sales order that you're using in your current system, take that sales order in your new ARP and see it all the way through. As you mentioned, changes always happen, but following a controlled change request process ensures that the changes are well thought out, tested and approved before being applied to production and proof of sensor to the end users. Okay? Once these, the system has been tested and user acceptance has been provided, it is customary that no additional changes should be done to prevent any rework and confusion to once you get to the end user training, which will happen in the next phase. The final preparation really is the home stretch. End user training is completed. The cutover strategy from the legacy system to your ERP is established and executed. The main objectives in this phase is to get the end users trained and confirm that their authorization in the system is appropriate and proper for the modules that they will need and in their roles. Once users are through their training and have had an opportunity to practice in a training environment, we usually do a user readiness test to ensure that they are able to get through their processes with little to no challenges. It is always important at this point to have a go no go conversation with the major stakeholders of the business to identify if there are any risks to go live and if they can't be mitigated or worst case scenario if the go live needs to be lit delayed, what does that plan look like? Once a go decision is provided, final master data is uploaded to your production environment and a cutover plan is identified. This is a very detailed plan and to get all of your open documentation from your legacy systems, open GL balances from your financials, from your legacy system into the new ERP. And lastly, before go live, Establish a post go live support plan so that it's put in place to ensure your users and the business are supported and that the proper resources are allocated to make sure that you guys will be successful. This is close to a go live date. Uh, a few things to really take into consideration to make sure you meet that date is when you're planning your end user training, make sure that it is in a format that is appropriate for your team and business. This could be classroom training train the trainer model or one-on-one. -on -one. And it can really vary depending on the function, the team or the person that you're training. Enable your end users as much as you possibly can by developing some internal reference guides for process steps, mandatory fields or any specific formats that may be required. Tracking your team's performance during their practice sessions and their progress helps you to identify if there's maybe additional training requirements um, or training requirements necessary. Maybe they're constantly missing a particular step or if they're not getting to you know, practicing at all, there's some conflict in their schedule that needs to be addressed and so that they can be reprioritized. When we establish the cutover plan, it can be very overwhelming because there's a lot of data that sits in your legacy system or systems. Um, so we really like to put a clear place, uh, plan in place to make sure that it's a less daunting task and everybody really understands what has to be brought over versus what can be left behind. As you said, we don't like to, you know, we don't plan for a go live date not to happen, but just in case things do need to pivot, have a plan B in place. It is important to know in advance how you and your team will pivot if it's necessary to do so. And lastly, we're on the go live date. The time is finally here. You get to the go live date uh, and you're ready to go live with your systems. What this truly means is that all your legacy systems now become reference systems instead of productive systems. They don't necessarily go away. You can still go to them to review anything, but they are no longer your system of record. All your financials, opening balances, and open transactions are now in your new ERP. And your end users start performing their day-to-day -day work in that new ERP system. We typically get asked, you know, what does a go live week look like or go live um, weekend? Um, so we won't go through all the details on this slide, but this is just a high level view. So we typically start a cutover on the weekend to really minimize the impact to the business. And so that Monday is the first transactional day. Um, so when you guys start doing your go live uh, weekend plans, use this just as a starting point to set some expectations for everybody. To give your, your team the best chance at a successful go live, consider performing a mock cutover prior to the go live weekend. 
This gives everyone a better idea of the order of magnitude and effort required. It may be able to identify some areas that can be approved during the actual cutover. or you may realize, oh, there's a bunch of documents we can close in the legacy system and so forth. I think we have somebody here, okay? Ensure that all the team members are also available to, on, on the go live weekend to provide information, make some decisions and perform the work. This is not just the consulting team, but also includes the business team members. So if the directors of finance, if something looks interesting on the financials, we really want to make sure we get somebody involved who can make a decision if something doesn't look correct. Once a customer is live, some consulting organizations move day one support over to a general support team. But we find having the team that was involved in the implementation process as critical. They already understand the business and it really minimizes the time between issue identification and resolution and really keeps the momentum going uh, on the uh, go live date. As the users start to use the system, issues or questions will come up. Put in place an issue log on day one and make it available to everyone to have an end of day discussion on how to resolve. Okay. Oftentimes issues are solved amongst the team during the day and so it only leaves the really critical issues for business uh, just, um, business leaders and the decision makers to help resolve. Once you're live, um, the fund doesn't really end at the go-live date of an ERP. Digital transformation is a really an ongoing process for all the organizations, so it's important to keep up to date with your support and continuous improvement plan. Uh, support versus maintenance. It's really important to understand the difference between these. People often use that word very interchangeably, but they mean distinctly different things. Maintenance work is any work that is a result due to a bug in the software, including the identification of issues, acknowledgement from the software vendor that it is indeed a bug and the resolution to correct. This work is covered in either your subscription licensing, if you are a, on a subscription license basis, or on your maintenance fees if you are a perpetual license at ERP. Okay? Support work on the other hand is, is work that is requested by the business from your implementation partner. That is helped with troubleshooting errors, enabling a changing functionality, or maybe even some additional training functionality. Make sure that your ERP partner also has a proper support channel put in place so that the, at the end of the day, implementation team is really good for the initial uh, support, but over a period of time, you have access to more resources in general. Once on the ERP journey, it is really a process of continuous improvement. During the implementation phases, your users will get exposed to functionality that they could see potential future of projects for. We encourage our customers to establish quarterly calls with your key contact of your implementation partner so you can stay on top of new functionality and your partner can understand your business needs to help you with solving the challenges within your ERP. And sometimes even outside your ERP, get exposed to a lot of software that we can even just make you aware of if you have a business issue that doesn't fall in your ERP solution. So Neil, I'll hand it back to you and we can take some uh, questions. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Rachel and Aaron. Um, I, I would like to now open it up, open up the floor to some questions from the audience. So please use your chat function uh, for any questions that you might have. I'll, I'll give you a few minutes here and I will stop sharing, just facilitate this. Any chat? Yes, and the first uh, question here we have is just to, will you share the slides and can we have access to the recording? Absolutely, we will be sending that out uh, after the fact and uh, no problem at all there. Give a few more minutes or a few more seconds for some questions. All right, so we do have uh, one question first from the uh, audience here. Um, an ERP implementation is a long process. How do we keep the project on track? I think that's more on the impl implementation side for Erin. Sure. Um, during a kickoff meeting, the project manager from the implementation partner side, as well as the internal PM uh, at the client, to establish a weekly touch point um, to go through the project plan and tasks that need to be completed on a, by which particular due date to make sure we stay on track. 
we like to use a collaborative tools like Asana for our projects so that everyone can see the tasks that they're responsible for, not just on our end, but also on the client side. Often we need things like show us example of what your layouts are gonna look like. We need some sample data and so forth. Um, and because of that, it, it also shows where the dependencies are. It really quickly shows us if a project is starting to slip so that we can adjust and plan accordingly to keep it back on track. Perfect, okay, awesome. We do have actually a few more questions coming in here. Uh, another one is how do you handle external systems data such as an e-commerce site or EDI trading partners? From, uh, from the implementation side, I will quickly talk about what that looks like. Um, for uh, e-commerce solutions, we typically are the help with the integration side. Um, it, as I mentioned in the start, it is important to identify your team. And if e-commerce and EDI are in scope, those team members should have a representative as part of the project team. Um, so we also make sure that they are involved, they understand where their touch points are, and that that scope of work is properly defined. They may have their own proposals and their own scope of work, but where, where that crossover and touch point is, we really make sure that we, we do that with a fine tooth comb. Awesome. One question that's coming in, I think more on the on Rachel's side, is, is how do you know which ERPs to really include in your ERP uh, selection process? There are so many out there, it's such a saturated market. How do you filter them down? Yeah, I think the um, there are definitely a ton of them. I think there's a couple ways to start filtering down your ERP systems. Um, we want to, and that goes into the requirements kind of piece. But when we think about different ERP systems, we want to think about what business processes are going to live in here versus not, and are going to live in e-commerce, are going to live in marketing platforms or CRM platforms or those other places, because that helps to filter down even which ERPs offer which applications and which components of the system. But we also want to think about, you know, do they have a data repository on site in Canada? Does that matter to us? There's certain ERPs that do, and there's certain ones that don't. So if we need to have the data storage in Canada, that might be something that kind of filters out some of them. Um, we want to think about tier of ERP. Um, and this is something that's probably a larger conversation, but, you know, tier one, two, three, we're really talking about complexity of the system, how much data is in the underlying data structure, that might really change which ones you look at or don't. Um, and then also thinking about to the earlier question, if we have other solutions that are in play, like e-commerce sites and things like that, we want to look at what the pre-built API, those integrations are that exist with other technologies we already have in play in our environment are not going to replace place, ideally you want to try and find an ERP solution that already has successfully integrated with those different systems. Awesome. Thanks for that, Rachel. Yeah, and I do appreciate, uh, there's definitely lots of questions coming in from the, uh, the chat here. Uh, another one for Rachel is, you know, how much time or effort will our staff need to dedicate to, to the project ultimately? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really great question. I, the the piece that I would start with is when we're thinking about making sure we're super clear on the requirements of what we even need for this ERP system, you want to make sure that you have at least one subject matter expert for each of the business processes that are going to come into play. And even just to map out what that current state process looks like and the challenges and, and design out that future state business process, you know, they need to account for about four hours just to do that for process. Like there's pieces that need to come into play that are heavier lifts in that requirements gathering phase. So really people need to be able to carve out a couple hours a week for that, for a couple of weeks in that, in that discovery phase. And then they need to cover out, uh, take out a bunch of time for that training, that pre-training before blueprinting that Erin was talking about, time for the blueprinting review, time to do user acceptance testing is a big bucket of time that they need to set aside for that one week. So really carving out, you know, 10 to 20 hours of testing, depending on their role and how involved they're going to be in the actual solution. And then training, who's going to actually do the training inside your organization, and that's going to take up a bunch of their time. So it will depend on who, on what their role is on the project, how much time they need to allocate. And that's something that we would help with the planning phase, really, like making sure that we're super we're clear on how much of an impact this is going to have on their capacity so that you can kind of plan around it and and marry it up with everything else that they have on their plate so there's there's a lot that goes into that 
For sure. And, and I know just in terms of the implementation, what we see is, is typically common is that there's maybe, you know, one to two days across all of the resources that are part of that project team on the customer side. That's, you know, we're, they're dedicating one to two days per week um, to the implementation uh, in the implementation partner. Uh, so we understand that you obviously have a, a full-time job and a business to run. So it's it's not necessarily something that you're, you know, spending five days to a, a week doing. Um, another question here that we have from the chat is, you know, where do you see the, the major challenges or oftentimes when there are cost overruns, you know, how can we avoid them and, and just what, what, what uh, ends up um, attributing to those challenges? Um, for, from our perspective, there really are three major reasons why cost overruns happen. Um, one, if the scope dramatically changes throughout the project. Scope defined early on gets provided with a proposal and an estimate. It's okay if scope changes, but that is usually where cost really gets you know, much bigger. Uh, during COVID, we definitely saw um, you know, people mid-implementation having to go to e-commerce. That is scope change integrating into there. Completely fine and completely understandable. That's where changes come in and where the scope and the, and the cost can increase. Secondly, I guess starting and stopping a project is very costly. Not to continue using COVID references, but we all saw what happened when the supply chain got brought to a grinding halt and really getting that back up. We we're all seeing the, the increase in costs and the impact of the supply chain, although on a much smaller scale, same sort of impact. If you bring it to a stop to get it back up and running, there's a lot of rework and a lot of ramp up that needs to happen. And lastly, uh, inability to commit or make a decision. If we don't have the proper people in the room where we're providing people with options on decisions of how the ERP needs to be configured, there's a lot of telephone that happens. We will present an option, they will go present it to the person who can make a decision, something gets lost in translation, and then that session has to be had all over again. Whereas if we have the right person in the room, the, the, the time from issue identification to resolution is much smaller and the cost is really kept under control. Great. Thank you, Renee. Uh, one question that just came in, how do you scope and then deal with integrations in this process? I think that's more on Rachel's side. Yeah, I think the, the big piece is you want to identify any of those integrations that are going to be needed right at the onset of that discovery process. So that goes into our technical requirements before we even get to ERFP, before we start shortlisting anybody, because we do want to think about what are the integrations we already know have to be in place before go live. So between our e-commerce solution that already exists and our new ERP, for instance, and what are some of the integrations that we know we're planning on in our technology strategy? which it ideally would be in, in place before you go down an ERP road is to really say like, what are all of the technologies we're looking to either improve for their leverage or introduce over the next three to five years. If we know what that looks like, even at a rough level, we can start figuring out what are those integrations we need to plan for in the technical requirements? What are some of the solutions that may or may not be in those short lists? So we think about them again in that RFP process and picking our ERP. Um, so thinking about those elements. So should come up in discovery um, and really should be a part of those technical requirements. And then as Irene was talking about before, we want to make sure that you know, when we're getting into blueprinting phase and we're trying to think about what this really needs, what this ERP really needs to look like in terms of its design and structure, we need to think about what other vendors need to be a part of that conversation to make sure we don't miss somebody and something that's really critical. Because when we're thinking about um, the master data, we want to think about what is the source of truth for all of this master data most of it is going to be in your ERP. But we know that e-commerce is going to rely on data in the ERP and it's going to push data back into your ERP. We need to make sure it's all using the same language and the same field names and all that good stuff that goes into that integration to make sure they do talk and play nicely together. So all of that needs to be really discussed in detail during that blueprinting phase. But we need to know as much as at least we do at the beginning way up in discovery to make sure that all of the, the proposals that come in through the ERP partners, that they have all the information they need to make an accurate proposal. So that, that really needs to happen in the beginning. Looks like we just have just under eight minutes left. Uh, I've got one or two more questions that are coming through right now. 
But uh, once we get through this, if we give you a few minutes back of your day, that's always a, a good thing as well. Um, one question that just popped up, how do you make sure your staff is going to use the ERP properly once it actually goes live? I think Irene and I could pro pro probably talk a lot about this <laughs> one. Um, it, you know, the first piece that we need to see, like on the discovery side of things, we do need to think about who needs to be a part of the conversation across our different stakeholders in the business so that they are engaged and they have some buy-in in the choice that we ultimately make in our ERP. If we don't include certain businesses, like if we don't include operations business users up front in discovery, this ERP is, is going to be a bit of a change management nightmare. You need to involve the people that are going to use the system in defining what those requirements are going to look like, in participating in the demos with the vendors, in ultimately being a part of that decision that gets made so that they're bought into what we ultimately purchase. And they certainly need to be heavily involved in blueprinting because they're the only ones that actually know how this needs to work within business process and within our warehousing space and all that other good stuff. Um, so really it's about looking at, you know, how do we make sure that we're involving people in those different phases so that when we get to the point of user acceptance testing, they've already been involved. They do test the heck out of that system. When they get to training, you already have some super users, some champions in the business that have been along for this entire ride and can go back to their other peers and say, this system is great. I do see the benefits of it. I'm going to show you how to use it so that that you actually have people that are excited about this tool and are ready to use it. They've been they've been trained accurately and, and deeply enough to use it effectively. Awesome. All right, I think we have one last question here. And I think it's an it's a important question that uh, a lot of companies start to really ask as they go through this process. And really, who should be a part of my implementation team is, is the question. There, I, I'll take that one, Neil. Um, yeah. For uh, every um, organization has companies that um, that has a financial business, right? The start of an ERP backbone is your financial system. So a controller or a director of finance is critical to understand that everything comes really off of the finance side and understanding how everything pop comes back to the financials and to the reporting. Now, depending on what your type of business is, and if you're heavy in logistics, uh, you know, getting your director of logistics involved or your warehouse managers involved and have a person who can speak on behalf of the, that department in the organization. Similarly, on the procurement side, all companies buy things, you know, making sure that you have an, a key individual there who can say, this is how we need to procure things, whether we're producing it or whether we need to purchase it, whether we are making to order or we are making to stock, but they really have a view of what this is going to look like in the future. So we, we typically like from a subject matter expert to have individuals that really can represent their area of the organization critically for it. On the sales side, we would usually like a salesperson, but most organizations like to keep their salespeople selling. So it usually is a representative from the customer service side or from a chief revenue officer type of uh, view and to really have a conversation and tell us what their, what their needs are. Um, you may notice that, you know, we don't have IT person, the first person on our list. IT is very important from an accessibility, internet networking and devices perspective. But ERPs are business systems and we need business people involved because it can't be left for the IT team to make some business decisions uh, at that point. They're a critical part, but historically people have, have marked them as IT projects when in fact they are business projects with technology. Right. And I know one question just came out that came out there. So let's just kind of squeeze one last one in and then we'll wrap things up here. But uh, uh, this this person mentions, uh, not sure if we've already covered this. What happens if along the way a business brings a new integration, APIs or tools after an ERP has already been implemented? How do you deal with that? Yeah, I think this is this is very common um, because, you know, you you implement your ERP system and then and you live with it for 10, 15, however many wonderful years, you're going to introduce other technologies along the way. So this this certainly is an expect is an expected thing. Um, so it's really about once you know that you want to bring in a new tool, engaging with your implementation partner on the ERP side and saying, you know, this is the tool that we're evaluating. 
Do you have pre-built API connections with it? What, how would this impact our master data? How would it impact the source of truth of data? How would we need to integrate this? What are our different options? What do you recommend? And I would suggest looping in your implementation partner before buying that other tool so that they can give you a heads up on what that maintenance cost would look like, what the implementation cost of that configuration and integration would look like, so that you can factor that into your business decision about which other tool you would purchase. I'm not sure, Erin, if there's other elements of that that come into play. Uh, you nailed it. Um, I completely agree. That it's it helps to have us involved uh, in the in the front end, um, you know, so that we can also sometimes take a look at the back end to, to see what what is behind the scenes. A lot of people have APIs. It depends on the quality of APIs, the documentation behind APIs. You compare Shopify to some other e-commerce. You know, you're not comparing apples to apples there. Um, and from uh, from an implementation partner perspective, we also treat it some, somewhat like a mini project where we would put a proposal together, almost do a little bit of a blueprinting to make sure all the business decisions are well thought out, provide you with a proposal and saying, this is what the timeline estimates and efforts are going to be before we even start doing any sort of nuts and bolts and configuration changing. Great. Well, I think we'll we'll wrap up there. And, and I think it was a fantastic session today. We really appreciate your participation. We hope that you can walk away with a few tidbits that will truly help you along your digital transformation journey moving forward. Uh, thank you again to our speakers, Erin A. and Rachel. Well done. Uh, please, to the audience, don't hesitate to reach out to myself or any of our speakers if you have any questions or would like to dive deeper into any of the topics that we uh, covered today. Uh, so with that, thank you so much once again and, and have, a have a great day. Thank you, everyone.